Story 1. Squirrel Hunting in Texas. 1978. The first visual experience that I ever had came deep in the woods from the road. I had walked about a mile down in the woods where I came upon a flat. I could see all the way through the flat to the other side, which was roughly 175 yards. On the other side of the flat was a stand of reset pine, all about 15 feet tall, with dead grass underneath. Immediately, I noticed something laying underneath a pine tree across the flat. At first, it looked like the area below the tree and the trunk of the tree had been burnt out. As I eased closer, it began to look like a gorilla laying under the tree. I am a pretty stealthy person in the woods, and I told myself, I am just seeing things, but I am going to try and get closer to this thing, just to prove to myself that I am not seeing this. As I moved within 100 yards or so, I could see that I was not crazy. Its head was moving, and at this time, I could tell its color was gray with a black gorilla face. The adrenaline kicked in. I checked my gun, put some trees between myself and this thing, and proceeded to try and get closer, peering around the trees every few feet just to see if it was still there. I got to within 50 to 75 yards, peering around the tree, and it was now gone. The floor of the flat was dry, with a lot of crunchy leaves and twigs. I knew I was going to scare it off before I could get as close as I liked to. After I noticed that it was gone, I sat down in the flat for about an hour and did not see any wildlife at all. I then got up and went over to the area where I had seen it and was hit with that smell. The grass was mashed down underneath the pine. At first, I don't think that I knew it was there because it was moving its head and acting unconcerned. As I tried to sneak up on it though, it definitely sensed my presence or heard me crunch a twig. I know that it never visually made me out, because I kept trees between myself and it the entire time. 1979. It had rained sometime between 3 a.m. and when I had set out to go squirrel hunting. It was very foggy and misty on this morning, and the woods were damp and quiet. I came upon a large thicket and sat down against a tree at the edge of the thicket. Instantly, I began to smell something. As it got lighter out, light enough to shoot, I could hear something in the thicket. Also, I noticed there were no squirrels moving. I thought that there were some hogs in the thicket. I sat in this spot longer than I normally would sit somewhere without seeing anything. Because of the sounds that I heard coming from the thicket, about mid-morning, I was hearing something sniffing the air, making low, deep grunting sounds. This was no hog. I decided to play a trick that I have used before on game in thickets and throw a two-foot section of a dead limb over and beyond the sounds hoping to flush it out to my side. When I did this, it made a deep and louder primate type grunt right at me. The sniffing of the air also became more pronounced and no hog breaths like this. I then threw another stick into the thicket and received the same grunts and sniffing, only louder. About 20 minutes later, I heard it moving through the thicket, and then heard a huge, two-legged splash into a body of water on the other side, followed by grunts and heavy breathing. And there is no doubt in my mind what I had encountered was a Bigfoot in the thicket. Although I never saw him, 
This was something I had never experienced in the woods before. After the splash and exit, I made my own hasty exit back to the road. Story 2. Nearly Colliding with a Bigfoot January of 2004. My girlfriend at the time and I were on our way to visit family in Texas. We share an apartment in a suburb of Houston. The quickest route to my mom and stepdad's house is through Cleveland, Texas, and we take 105 from there to almost counts. Around midnight, we left from Kingwood and traveled through Cleveland onto 105. We had been on the 105 for about 20 minutes, about 45 minutes from Kingwood. We were approaching the Trinity River bottom when I noticed something in the center of the road. My girlfriend was dozing beside me and I yelled, thinking we were about to be in an accident. She sat up and screamed that we were about to hit him. I locked the brakes of her truck up and when I did, whatever it was stood up in the road and started to run to our right towards the woods my girlfriend began to open her door and I grabbed her to stop her. She yelled that it was a Bigfoot. I had heard of them. I mean, who has not? But to be honest, until that very moment, I would have never believed that they existed. By the time I looked up from her, the creature was standing on the side of the road, watching us. When she opened her door, the creature made like a squalling sound and turned into the woods. I think it was around seven feet tall. I'm not too sure. I do know it was quite a bit taller than myself. It was black in color, but it had what looked like mud on its legs and arms. The fur or hair was long. It was on my girlfriend's side of the truck about 10 feet away, and she said its hands were long and the thumbs were not right. I'm not sure what she meant other than they looked longer, I think. To be honest, not too sure how to describe that. Where the thing was squatting in the road was a doe that had been hit by the car. I'm not sure if it was looking or feeding on the doe, but it had been moved by it. You could see where the creature had shifted the animal on the road, or at least it looked like that when I got out to look. I've read on the BFRO when I decided to post my incident that there was another lot of other times. When we got out, I really could not remember any other thing or any other odor or anything else that was strange. I'm not too sure of what else to tell. Story 3. Running Away My wife and I were crossing the Trinity River on the Highway 101 just before sunset on May 29, 2004, after having been to a baseball game. The west bank of the Trinity was a long sandbar, and there were a few people, roughly 10 to 15, spread out alongside the sandbar doing various things. There were a few kids and a dad camping. Two guys sitting on a tailgate. There was a couple farther down fishing. And there was another truck backed up to the sandbar with its stereo playing. My wife and I drove down to the sandbar, had to engage the four-wheel drive to avoid getting stuck, and turned around to go back to the highway. We got back out on the highway, and my wife asked me to drive on across the bridge to the other side. I did so. My wife saw that she called a waterfall off the left side of the bridge. Actually, it was just water running over rocks and a small creek off the Trinity. We turned off on a dirt road just past the bridge, drove over a small wooden bridge over my wife's waterfall and came to a gate 
that was locked with two separate padlocks. Keep in mind that this area is very heavily wooded, swampy and marshy in areas, and very highly inhospitable once you step foot into the woods. At the gate, we got out of my truck, climbed the gate just to look around the area. We could hear the music and the kids playing across the river, probably a quarter of a mile back across the bridge. On the other side of the gate, the road turned into a two-track trail. There had been vehicles down there, probably within the last month. We walked down the trail. The sun was setting, and it was starting to get dark. This was very impromptu, and we had not planned for this jaunt at all. My wife had heels on. I walked on ahead, probably 30 feet ahead of my wife. And there was a sign that indicated that the area was a private hunting club area. We were very quiet and made very little sound. It was then that I saw it, about 40 yards down the trail, where the trail turned sharply to the left. It leapt across the trail, much like a long jumper, landed on the right side of the trail, and leapt again into the woods. Quickly, quietly, and in the blink of an eye. It was a rustic red color, about six feet tall, and extremely fast. In an instant, my mind tried to ascertain what it was that I saw. I kept telling myself, no way, no way. But my data banks could not process it or link it to any other creature that I had ever seen. I saw no face and do not remember seeing arms or feet. But I did see an upright something about six feet tall leap ten feet across the trail and spring into the woods. I turned a whisper loudly to my wife. Did you see that? No. She was busy dealing with a slimy, slithery something that slithered across her foot. She was quite distraught, and her encounter happened at exactly the second that might occurred. When she realized what had happened, she quickly jogged up to me, and we jogged to the spot of the crossing. When we arrived at the crossing area, we could hear the animal still running through the woods sending birds to flight near its path. It was then that I smelt a musky smell, much like a horse, actually. We looked for tracks of any nature, but found absolutely nothing. The creature cleared the road, and the road was the only place that tracks would have been made. We turned to look to the left, and there in the woods was a clump of uprooted trees with fresh sod still on the roots, as though they had been recently been put there. I'm sorry, but I can't say with certainty that what I saw was a Bigfoot, but I can say with certainty that what I saw was, number one, rustic orange red, number two, approximately six feet in height, number three, incredibly fast, Number four, appeared bipedal and upright. Lastly, number five, not a deer, coyote, cat, horse, human, fox, bear, wolf, hog, dog, or any other indigenous animal that I have ever seen in Texas. And I was raised in the backwoods of East and Central Texas. We had no cameras with us, but even if we had, the creature was way out of sight before I could have ever drawn any camera, and he was way too fast for any hope of pursuit. We summarized that perhaps he had been watching the people across the river from a very safe and secure position until he saw us coming up the road, at which time he fled in a panic. He probably saw us long before we saw him. When I first saw him, 
he was in midair, leaping across the road. He touched down, sprung up and into the woods. We heard him for a few seconds after we arrived at the crossing area, and then it went silent, save for the people noises from across the river. We thought that he may have stopped and surveyed us from a hidden position. We looked around for just a few minutes and had to return to the truck. It was getting dark in a hurry, and we were largely unequipped. If you or someone you know has a story or encounter they would like to share with me or have me read on this channel, please submit it to stories at whatlooksbeneath.com. You can find the email in the description below. This incident occurred after my husband, myself, and our three children and I had moved up to some land that we purchased on Sugarloaf Mountain, west of Boulder, Colorado. My husband at the time managed a tavern and had purchased the five-acre silver mining claim for a song from at the bar and on a paper napkin. We built a tiny 12 by 16 cabin and squeezed ourselves in there on the south side of the mountain, about two thirds of the way along the original little mining road. The cabin was on only level land on a heavily treed and rocked parcel. The north side of the cabin snugged right up against the mountain slope with pine trees all around that side was two plywood sections high, which would have put it a hair over 16 feet. We had an oversized plywood platform, bunk bed in the northeast corner of the cabin, which we adults and our baby daughter on the first level, and the two boys on the upper level. We put in a little window up there for them, for air, and put in an inside shutter on it, so they could close it when it got really cold which sometimes it did. It did reach 40 below the very first winter we were there. I think it was during the second autumn there, so it would have been 1971. Our then five-and-a-half-year-old son claimed he had heard the sound of footsteps in the early evening after hearing a really strange sound, definitely an animal, but he had no words at that age to describe it. He said, that it sounded like a call of some sort, and bigger than an owl. Some kind of hooting, I guess. Then, he heard some noises close by, rustlings, etc. When he looked up, through the open shutter window, he explained that he looked right into the face of a monster. All I know for sure is that I'll certainly never forget his terrified screams. When he did calm down, he described it as dark and very hairy and a funny face and glowing eyes. It turned and ran away as soon as he began screaming. His brother, two years older, slept through the entire incident until his brother's shrieks woke us all. With the ground sharply slanted up, we figured something would have to have been just about seven to eight feet tall to peer up into that upper window. Not being trained trackers, we found no evidence the next day. But our son, who at this time is now almost 35, swears to this day that it was Bigfoot that he saw. And I have always believed him, since there was no way in the world that, at his age, he could have made up that precise and auditory and visual image or his terror. He came over and visited us this morning. I told him about the article in the post, and he reiterated his story. He says the image of the face has never left him, and probably never will. My name is Leona. My son, his wife, a friend, and I saw a Sasquatch on August 10th of 1990, 11 a.m., on a bright sunny day in Larimer County, Roosevelt National Forest, about 25 miles just northwest of Fort Collins. I suppose the nearest highway would be Highway 34. That goes through Loveland, about 20 miles away. We had bought a small piece of property 
and were building a bridge across Buckhorn Creek. We took a break, and my son, Dallas, was skinning a mountain to the west of us with his binoculars when he saw it. My daughter-in-law grabbed the binoculars and looked, and she said, It's chasing some deer. Then, oh my goodness, Mom, it's got knees. She said it ran into a group of pine trees. I got my binoculars, and we stood, quietly, and waited. Several moments go by, and it leapt out from the trees and went running across the face of the mountain. I swear, that thing could run like the wind. And this was rugged terrain. But it had a very strange, distinctive gait. The friend that was with us saw it without binoculars. I guarantee you it was not a fake. There is zero possibility that it could have been. No human could run that fast, especially in a costume, if this was, and especially across that rugged mountain, and it was at least seven feet tall. What is puzzling is that it did not seem to fit with things I have read about them. This one was pitch black, not reddish brown, and it was seen in bright daylight. It was the middle of the day. It was chasing deer, which I thought would rule out it being a vegetarian. Another thing that I thought was very interesting was that a huge bird, perhaps a vulture of some kind, kept circling around where the thing was, like maybe it was waiting for it to make a kill. My son insisted that it had a tuft of snow-white hair on its head. We didn't report the sighting because, well, we didn't think anybody would believe us. Plus, we didn't want some gun-happy nuts trying to hunt it down. My husband and I have been living out here ever since that time, and we've been staring at the same mountain for years, but we've never seen another one. Nevertheless, I feel truly blessed that I got the chance to see one of these creatures that are apparently so elusive and by many claim don't exist. In 1971, I saw some very large footprints in the snow in the summer high in Colorado wilderness area. These prints were at least half again as big as a human footprint, and the stride length was much longer than any human, at least four feet or longer. They looked exactly like human prints. They were not bare. I recognized those they proceeded across several small remaining snow patches on a mountainside meadow. There were about a dozen or more clear prints. I saw none on the ground between the snow. The ground was firm and damp. I saw no other suggestive evidence, but was not searching for any. I was scared and wanted to get out of there ASAP. I wondered if they may have been human, and had enlarged, spread out by heating and melting, cooling and refreezing. That does occur at that time of year, in the little snow patches. But the detail was fairly preserved, and one would think that any melting and refreezing would blur those details. The possibility of this phenomenon should be closely examined. Somebody should walk through the summer snow patches barefooted, then observe the prints for a number of days during the summer, when this melt and refreeze process does occur. If the enlarging of the prints and spreading of the stride does not occur, I assume these prints I saw were clearly not human. If they do spread out, maybe somebody just walked through there barefooted. I wondered if it was a hoax, but the area was quite remote, and the perpetrator would have to know somebody would pass that exact spot. I don't recall if we were on an established trail or just wandering near our campsite. Also, if it was a hoax, why would they put the prints in the snow, since one could not predict exactly when it would melt in the unpredictable summer weather? I have no particular interest in the existence of Sasquatch, but as a scientist, I am curious. 
Having seen these prints with my own eyes, I definitely believe it is possible. There were two friends who were with me, and we all saw the same thing. I am now 46 years of age and was in high school at the time that I saw this. We normally walk our dog off lead, but entering the start of the hike, at the west entrance, my wife and dog were immediately on high alert. My wife wanted our dog on lead, as she was spooked. By the way, this was the western side of the railroad grade trail, above Chalk Lake. So, after approximately a quarter mile, I noticed animal droppings that appeared large human-shaped, under the uphill undergrowth, spaced every 10 to 20 feet. I even commented on the size and shape of the droppings with my wife, and we agreed. They couldn't be human, as there were too many, and under the branches of the uphill side, we discussed how they appeared to be marking a territory. The droppings continued for maybe 150 feet. We continued down east on the trail, at about the half-mile mark, a deer startled us, running from the uphill side across the trail and down the other. My wife was spooked, and we turned around to go back. As we neared the spot where the droppings were, I spotted a single footprint on the uphill side, partially hidden by branches. I took pictures using my water bottle and shoe, size 10 for comparison. I wanted to spend more time, but my wife and dog were very agitated. I spent five minutes searching for a rock, or a log, or anything that would fit in the form of the print, thinking it must have been a rock to have left such a deep, clear impression. No such luck. We left in a hurry. There was also no unusual smells. No other bikers or hikers on the trail that day. Our dog was, for whatever reason, on high alert the entire time. He is a Kelpie cattle dog, very intelligent, very well trained, and very intuitive to his surroundings. We all have spent time hiking in bear country and are very comfortable in the bush. There's no other reason why our dog would be on such high alert. Something was with us that day, or close by. On Thursday, July 25th, my girlfriend and I were hiking in Mayflower Basin, south of Colorado 91. We were up in the basin, and Helen had gone ahead to the foot of the basin. I was about 100 yards off the three minor log cabin remnants, sitting on a rock, enjoying some peanuts and water, when, looking west, I saw a very large brown biped approached the snow wall, cornice, and seek to climb it. The biped was unable to climb up over 20 feet, moved back down laterally to its right, and then down to the ground off the snow. It then walked on two legs, very briskly to the right, subsequently out of my view. About four to five minutes later, a hiker with his dog came walking down the trail, and I later saw this brown biped from time to time walking above the snow, southbound. I did not see it again. Helen had returned to me, and we discussed, then walked down to the locked gate, prohibiting cars into the basin to talk with the hiker. His name was Robbie, his dog Dallas. We agreed to scale up the trail to where I had seen the brown biped. Helen took longer, but Robbie and I reached the area found handprints in the snow in an arc, one print lower with three big fingers and one thumb. Footprints were not descriptive of toes, arch, and heel. We took photos and will share if interested. We then traversed a right, north on difficult terrain. That is quite slanted where the biped moved quickly and appearing easily. No further sighting. This was now about 2.30 p.m. when I had seen the biped at about 1.45. Returning back to the dirt road and the parking lot 
by bushwhacking through the forest. Also, the brown biped sought to scale snow wall, tried only once, then moved laterally to ride off snow. Then, when Robert and I got there, it was very hard for us to traverse. He is a 47 Gulf War veteran. I and six, and even with two ski poles for stability, was very hard to traverse. From 2010 through 2015, I was living out of a van. I would travel all over the country, staying in Walmart parking lots, friends, driveways, campsites, oftentimes just down some path in the woods that was wide enough to fit my vehicle. I have countless wild adventure stories from that five-year period, but I'll share with you one that really left a mark, both physically and mentally. For the last two years of my homeless stint, I had stuck to the east coast of the United States, slowly making my way north to New Hampshire and Maine in the warmer months, then heading slowly south as winter approached to avoid the blistering cold of the northern states and the eastern U.S. I had made friends and contacts from Florida to Maine and would stop for a week or two at certain locations to work, make some travel money, visit with people I knew along the way. One of the ways I would make money was with buying and selling antique guns. So, I would do my best to avoid certain states that were not gun-friendly, like Massachusetts, Maryland, and New Jersey, as I would usually have a gun or two with me and would always have a threat of being harassed by the local and state police and due to my lifestyle. The previous years while heading north, I decided to save time by breaking my travel rule by passing through New Jersey. I had made friends while camping in the backwoods of New Jersey. People known as Pineys. They call themselves that because they live in a little known but fairly vast forest in the southern half of the state, known as the Pine Barrens. These good folks took an instant liking to me and spent almost a week living at my campsite with me. They worked as roofers during the day and drank booze and raised hell at night. They were super friendly, fiercely loyal and hardworking. In 2015, as I was heading south for central Florida, I made sure to swing by New Jersey again to hang with the Pineys, make a little cash roofing with them. So, I spent six 12-hour days roofing with my friends, stayed in my van, parked at my friends and the small farm in the Pine Barrens. On my seventh day, I decided that after hearing endless tales about the wonders of the Pine Barrens from my Piney friends all week, that I needed to go and explore the woods of southern New Jersey for a bit before heading south for the winter. I went online, found a campsite that allowed for vehicle camping, and was perfectly situated on the Molica River. It even had miles and miles of hiking trails. I kept a rather expensive folding mountain bike in my van, was always looking for a chance to take it out and explore. Due to the very flat land, the Pine Barrens was the perfect place for that. I set up camp, and was thrilled on the first night to be able to have a fire and enjoy the cool night air while losing myself in the dance of the flickering flames. I spent the next few days biking around the wilderness, fishing the river, and howling back and forth with the local coyotes at night. On the fourth night, things began getting weird. The coyotes that had kept me company each prior night were nowhere to be found, and I kept hearing a loud whistling every so often in the woods, just around my campsite. Just like a human whistle, except louder. Around midnight, I could hear somebody slowly circling me as I sat at my fire. It sounded just like a human, on two feet, trying to be quiet as they moved through the dead and dry leaves, just out of sight. I began to feel uneasy, even though it was not allowed in New Jersey. I grabbed my snub-nosed 357 Magnum out of the van and kept it in my jacket pocket. When most people think of New Jersey, they think of a densely populated city 
or Jersey Shore beaches. But make no mistake, Southern New Jersey can be as backwoods and deliverance feeling as parts of Western Virginia. Although it was a little risky, I decided that it would be best to keep my 357 on me for the rest of my time there, just to be safe. The next day, I spent the area exploring on foot. I hiked for miles and came across what looked like a primitive campsite. It had two small shelters made from branches, twisted saplings all weaved together. Inside one of the shelters was a few items of old torn clothing, an old functioning boombox, and a few chrome pieces of car. The shelters were in no way weatherproof, as there was no way to keep the rain out of them. So, I was very confused as to why somebody would go to such elaborate lengths to build them. On the edge of the campsite clearing were multiple trees that had fallen over away from the campsite. Four medium-sized pine trees fallen in opposite directions from each other, roots sticking out of the sandy soil. That afternoon, after a long day of exploration, I made my way back to my van, had a big meal, and went to sit on a bed of perfect moss along the edge of the Mullica River. I sat there, watched the sunset. The sun was about to dip down behind the trees, and I was sitting there with my headphones on, listening and relaxing to music, waiting for the evening to slowly creep in. I was feeling so alive. Just then, a barnyard-type smell filled the air around me, and I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand straight up. A chill ran down my spine. I began to pivot to my right, look behind me, and the last thing I remember was something smashing into the whole right side of my head and face. Tremendous pain. Then a loud ringing. I was awakened by the sting of a sharp tree branch scratching across the left side of my face. As I opened my eyes, I saw the ground beneath me moving, and my chin was bouncing off a solid hide with coarse hair as the earth moved below me. The pain in my head was almost unbearable. I fought to stay awake. These few seconds were very confusing. I opened my eyes again started to look around and saw two huge hairy legs below me, moving in stride. Then, I felt another almost unbearable pain as my ankles were compressed together, grinded against each other, while whatever was carrying me adjusted its grip around them, crushing them together. I realized all of a sudden that somebody was carrying me over their shoulder and moving quickly through the woods. I was in a state of shock. I was also in pain from my head to my feet, but a huge surge of adrenaline hit me all at once, and now I was wide awake. I was too afraid to start kicking and screaming and draw any attention to myself, so I went into a mental panic as I searched for an option in my head. Then it hit me. I remembered that I had my 357. It was in the small of my back in a leather holster with a snap button closure. My right arm was blocked by the creature head, so I reached behind myself with my left hand, quickly unsnapped the holster strap, struggled to free my gun as it was set up to be drawn by my right hand. Nevertheless, I managed to get it free, brought it in front of myself, thumb cocked the hammer, put the barrel right onto the hairy back directly below me, and squeezed the trigger. The gun went off, sending a 158-grain lead-nosed bullet into the right side of my attacker's back at point-blank range. The creature let out a bellowing scream, dropped me right on top of my head. I rolled onto my right side, and finally got a good look at what had been carrying me. It was no doubt a Bigfoot, there was no doubt at what I was looking at. I knew what it was the second I saw it, and have never been so terrified in my life. It was facing my direction while reaching its right hand behind itself and clawing at the hole 
I had put in its back, all while staring at me in disbelief. I still had the gun in my left hand, so I took aim at this monster again. When I pointed the gun, its expression changed from pure pain and disbelief to fear. I shot at it again, somewhere center mass as it was turning to run. It yelped, much like a dog does when it gets hurt, tore off into the brush at an incredible speed. I could hear it crashing through the brush and trees, like a freight train, as it ran off in the distance. I stayed there on my side for a few seconds, with my left hand still pointing the gun and shaking wildly. I then thought to myself, what if it comes back? Instantly, I was overwhelmed with fear. I jumped to my feet, sprinted as fast as I could in the opposite direction that this thing had gone. I ran for only a few hundred yards before I knew where I was. It would seem that the Bigfoot had only gone a short distance before I had woken up. I ran to my campsite, started frantically throwing everything haphazardly into my van. I was sure that this thing was going to come back for revenge at any moment. I checked the cylinder of my five-shot revolver, quickly replaced the two spent shells with fresh rounds, then stomped on the gas and ripped out of there. After a few minutes of driving on the dirt roads, I finally came out to the pavement, and my fear began to subside. But at the same time, the pain in my head and face spiked to terrible levels, so I headed for the nearest hospital. When I got to the ER, I did not even consider what I was going to tell them happened to me. I looked like I was hit by a Mack truck. Felt like it too. I decided to tell them that I was attacked by somebody in the woods. This was a bad idea. They had had a police officer there within a few minutes to take a report. He could tell I was not telling the truth, and kept pressing me to say what really happened. I stuck to my story, and he eventually left. Turns out I had suffered a bad concussion, as well as a torn eardrum in my right ear. The next day, my face swelled up so badly that my right eye was swollen shut, and my jaw hurt so badly that I couldn't even chew solid food for almost a week. I think that Bigfoot had smacked me hard with his open hand upside my head. But I can't be sure. Needless to say, I never went camping in the Pine Barrens after that. I called my friends from that area, told them what had happened to me, and they confirm that every so often, someone will encounter a Bigfoot creature like that in the woods, here, around where they live. Never again for me. Okay, so I would like to keep this somewhat discreet, because my family still to this day use what I told them as a joke against me. I don't need everybody in my town talking about me, because this just sounds ridiculous. This happened near Toms River, New Jersey. Me and my buddy were on our way to a job in Browns Mills, and were traveling down Route 70, which is known as the Pine Barrens. It was somewhere between 6 and 7 in the morning. About 7 deer came shooting out from the right side, going left across Route 70. I did not slam on brakes, because it was like 50 feet in front of us, but... I stopped pretty fast, and I kid you not, there was a big hairy gray and brown thing that came running right up to about three feet from the pavement. It stopped and turned around and ran the other way back into the woods. Since I seen this, I began watching that Finding Bigfoot show, but their videos and pictures are always something black. This thing was light gray and brown, and it was huge. I mean huge, like eight foot tall. Big, like fat big. It could not be a guy because it had hair all over its face. Like, I didn't even see its eyes or lips or nose. It was like hair for a face. We seen this thing at about 25, 35 feet. I know it was real, because my man was totally in sync with describing it to each other. It was all we talked about for the rest of the way to the job. It was like what I was thinking he was saying, and vice versa. 
This was just two months ago, and that was it. Hope this helps. I was a Boy Scout in the early 1970s on a camping trip. On a summer night, a friend and myself were out walking on a lone gravel road. Tall pine trees on both sides. It was the Bass River State Forest. The moon was full, and we were getting ready to crest a hill when we smelt something really foul. I thought something was dead and nearby. I didn't really think too much of it. We crested the gravel hill when we heard gravel being kicked. Mind you, the only light we had was the moonlight. When we heard this, we stopped, and I was a little scared because I thought it might be some guy in the woods scoping us out. We were frozen for a few moments, as to not make any noise. Then, we both saw a silhouette of a very large thing. Whatever it was, we were able to make out that it was like a giant hairball running across the road. We were pretty scared at this point, looked at each other, and said, let's get out of here. My guess is that it was at least seven feet tall, with a very heavy stride. We both took off back to camp. When we got back, we told our scoutmaster, and all he did was laugh and say, yeah, sure, now get back to bed. I kind of avoided it out of my mind for years, always believing that something was there, and I just kept it to myself. Then I found the BFRO, and reading lots of stories on this area. I'm 37 now, and to this day, I still think about that night, and wonder to myself, was I dreaming that night or not? I don't think I was. Riding my bike through the woods with some friends, I had to stop to wait for them when I heard a branch snap, no more than 40 feet away. It looked right at me with large black eyes. It was roughly 8 to 9 feet. I got a good look too. I'll never forget. He was proportioned the same way a human being would. It was scary. With blackish brown rust colored hair. The hairs on his arm were roughly three to four inches long. His form was about the size round as my leg, about 20 inches around. His strides were long, say 10 feet per step. He must have been watching me for something, because I stopped already a minute when I heard a branch snap. I glanced over. I was shocked, tried to figure out what I was looking at. He just stared. No noise, no motions, no gestures, no nothing. Very frightening, because you don't know what he is capable of. It was as if he was thinking of coming towards me. He was very close. I froze like a rock. I turned my head to see what my friends were doing, then turned back to look at him. He was still there. I know he got a good look at me too, because it looked like he stooped his head down slightly, peered hard at me. Then, he turned, raised his arms to gain his balance, and stepped into the woods. He didn't turn away from me, but rather walked my left, his right. Then I lost sight of him. I've told this story to many people, but I don't think anybody believes what I saw. I guess I, like, didn't believe it either, until I saw one with my very own eyes. It was at least 2 a.m. in January or February. The temperature was in the low teens. I was dropping off a friend at his home, the back of which was separated from the highway, Route 72, by roughly 200 yards of woods and a dirt road. There are no homes or street lights on this part of Route 72. The east side is completely untouched woods for miles that goes into Burlington County. This area was the end of a development that had never been finished. Work stopped in the late 1970s as a part of the Pinelands Preservation Act. There was a dirt road, about 30 yards behind the house, which connected to the east into a grid of unfinished, unpaved roads. At that time, his house was the last house on that road. 
completely surrounded by woods. We were talking beside the car, under the streetlight, for at least 20 minutes, when we both heard a woman screaming. It sounded like it was coming from the unpaved road behind his house. We both thought somebody was in trouble, so we ran inside his house, grabbed a flashlight, knife, and a hatchet. We ran into a trail along the right side of the house, southeast, which led out to the dirt road. We could hear the screams getting louder and more to our right, into the woods. We were only about 40 paces into the woods, when I began feeling very uneasy, and I began to realize that this wasn't a woman screaming. I could hear it now to my right, more like a loud whistling now, not ahead in the dirt road, like I had thought, about 15 yards away. We both stopped and listened for a few moments. My friend had the flashlight scanning the woods, which was new growth oak saplings, blueberry bushes waist high, and 12 feet to 14 feet, scrubby pine saplings, maybe 20 years old, if I'm guesstimating right. I could hear it heaving as it breathed in, exhaled out, with a very loud high-pitched whistling. We could not see anything, but it was very close to our right as we faced southeast, within 10 yards. My friend immediately turned toward me and said, That ain't no girl screaming. Quickly moved past me, back toward the house. I was standing still, listening. It was still screaming right at us. At this point, I knew it was not a girl at all. More like a loud whistling is how I would best describe it. There was no other screams that night. There was no movement at all. No sound of struggle. I thought that it might be a wounded animal, like a deer or something. It was so loud, and the deep breathing noises were from a much bigger animal than a fox. In fact, I could distinctly hear it breathing in and out rapidly to make this screaming noise. I remember thinking that it's dangerous to be this close to a large, wounded animal. It was not anything like I had ever heard in my life. I turned and headed back, looking and listening. It was still screaming, but did not follow. We instantly called the police and reported it. Within 15 minutes, we went back outside. Now the screams were further toward the southeast, very faint now. It had definitely moved off quickly. The screams faded totally within 10 minutes' time. We listened for at least another 45, but it was gone. I don't know what the police would have done after we'd called. I always just thought it was a wounded animal of some kind, but I guess I'm wrong. After reading the accounts posted, especially those from Ocean and Burlington counties, I knew that I also had a similar story. I had heard similar stories of a woman screaming in the woods and Manahawken from relatives who'd lived in the area since the early 1930s. They said it was accompanied by an awful smell and would come around at night during extremely hot or extremely cold seasons. They always expressed concerns that hunters would come and hurt or kill it, so it was a best-kept secret. I never believed them until I heard it for myself. Even after all these years, I still find it difficult to discuss what exactly I saw. I still vividly remember the encounter and how terrified my friend and I were afterwards. It's amazing how time slows down during intense moments. Every detail burned to my memory. But in actuality, only several seconds passed. To be honest, I don't know exactly what I saw that summer evening long ago. As a child growing up, we were taught in school the legends surrounding the Jersey Devil and weird happenings in the Pine Barrens. Hopefully this story won't be viewed as lore that the region is famous for. The only thing I can say for sure is it really did happen and I will do my best to portray the event as I remember it. I grew up in a middle-sized town, a few miles from both the Jersey Shore 
and the edges of the pine barrens. My neighborhood and town were undergoing a growth spurt, and wooded areas where I played as a kid were now strip malls or homes. My house was on a corner lot, and the neighbor's house directly in front was a summer cottage. They were not there at the time. I was 18 in 1989, and recently graduated from high school with a strict midnight curfew. My friend dropped me off at the time with the passenger side of the car facing the front of my house. I was outside of the car, talking to Scott through the passenger side window. That's when we both heard a rustling sound near the trees on the corner of my neighbor's property, about 30 feet away. There was a street light on the opposite corner, and I could not make anything out beyond it. We did not think much of it, and continued to talk. The rustling returned a little louder, and with a sound that I remember as something being dragged on concrete, such as a stick. At this point, I asked Scott if he saw anything over there. At first, his reply was no. Then he hesitated, said he sees something like a big dog that is sitting by the trees. Not wanting to be bit by some rabid dog, I got in the car. We went up the road and turned the car around on the opposite intersection. Once around, we were facing my house, and there was what appeared to be a large grayish dog directly under the street lamp. We began moving very slowly toward my house. As we got closer, it really did not appear to be like any dog I had ever seen before. When we were roughly 50 feet away, I turned to Scott, asked him to turn on the high beams. It is here where things happen very quickly, and I will try and capture it as best as I can. To our horror, what we thought was a large dog stood up and began to run on two legs. It crossed the car and ran on an angle at first toward the middle of my house, but then quickly changed course and went around the dark side of my house. We're both yelling, What is that? What was that? Repeatedly. The creature was very tall. His head was taller than the top of the windows on the house, so I'm estimating around eight feet. He appeared to be light gray in color, but it could have been the lights reflecting off his hair. His arms were long and lanky, sort of swayed forward as if he ran. He had amazing speed and agility, and ran with one would consider to be an odd gait. His head was tilted forward, and he might have been slightly hunched over. His head swayed between looking forward and looking at us. I will never forget the way his eyes reflected in the headlights. The total time we had eyes on the creature was around five seconds. But once he disappeared, the car accelerated around the corner, and Scott slammed on the brakes. Expecting to see the creature in the headlights, there was nothing but dark road. He was gone. Not wanting to get out of the car, we proceeded to Scott's house, just a few miles away. After a quick phone conversation with my parents, they demanded that I come home. They were waiting out front when we got there. We tried to explain what we saw. My parents would hear none of our tale and assumed we were either drunk or on drugs. We were both rather shaken by the event. My parents began to question their original assessment. Over time came the inevitable ridicule of family, friends, and alike. And their mocking I never really wanted to discuss with this anyone again. It took years before I was comfortable being alone, even at night. After spending time in the military, I came to the realization that he was as scared of us as we were June 17, 2013, Salt Fork State Park Bigfoot Ridge. Me and my girlfriend went to bed at about 10 p.m. Off and on, we heard really weird loud screams. At about 1 in the morning, she woke me up in terror because whatever it was making the noise was now outside her tent, just feet from our heads, pulling handfuls of grass. She was frozen with fear 
and waited for it to walk away. When it did, she opened the tent where she heard twigs cracking, shining the flashlight in that direction when she saw its really big yellow eyes. They were close together, and it turned towards the wooded tree line. We believed it watched us grab our stuff and end the trip early. We left our tent and hauled it out of there fast. We were completely traumatized over the experience and would like to talk to somebody who believes. We also believed we attracted it because I was knocking on trees just after sunset. We were told there were no other people supposed to be in the area, camping, but it looked like they left early also, leaving camping gear behind. It was just the two of us. And as for the environment, it was next to the marsh, a quiet and clear night. One thing to note is that all the frogs in the area had stopped making noise, all at once. And my dog was also acting weird, would not come out of the jeep. A follow-up investigation report was done by an investigator by the name of Mark DeRath. After interviewing the main witness and having multiple conversations, I'm convinced that in fact something did occur that night on and around the campsite. The fear and tone of their voices while recounting the experience was quite compelling. She was awakened by something walking around their tent making a sound similar to tearing out long grass. She listened for a short period of time while trying to wake up her boyfriend by nudging him. The walking sound became faint and then became quiet. She opened the tent door, crawled out with a flashlight on, and in hand scanning the surrounding area while on all fours. Towards the wood line, there was an area of tall reeds that led up to the forest. When her light shined in that direction, she clearly saw two large yellowish golf ball-sized eyes looking in her direction, standing in the reeds. Within seconds, the large eyes turned towards the forest and disappeared, making just a little noise on its departure. After seeing and hearing this, she panicked, abruptly awakening her boyfriend to the point that they both became quite concerned on what was out there. The boyfriend, who is six foot five, shined the flashlight in the woods, and had his sidearm, he had a concealed carry permit, ready while his girlfriend went to get their vehicle and drive it back to the campsite. He could hear the footfalls at what he estimated was a hundred feet into the woods. Once there, they quickly threw everything in the vehicle, drove straight home at around two in the morning, leaving their belongings and their tent behind. And they were the only tent at the primitive campground and were very shaken up by the whole experience. They joked around earlier in the evening and made wood knocks since the campground was called Bigfoot Ridge. I asked the witness if the eye shine was a possible owl, and she said absolutely not. She could faintly hear it walk away when it turned towards the wood line and stated there were no trees within 30 feet from where she could see it standing. She also stated that compared to her rather tall boyfriend, the thing she saw was much taller, and most definitely whiter. They also had a dog with them, but noted it was acting quite strange while tied up close to the wood line. After watching the dog's behavior, they all decided to put the dog in the vehicle before they went to bed. The dog did not bark the entire night once in the vehicle. Sunday I was a vendor at Creature Weekend at Salt Fork State Park on May 4th. At around 9.45 p.m., a fisherman that was in a tournament came in all shaken up and said that, at first, I thought you guys were a bunch of nuts, until now. So, he began to tell his story to the other vendors. So, this grabbed my attention. I went over to listen and there were about five of us that decided to go out the next morning at about 6 a.m. to check out the site. So I got there at 5, waited, and said to myself, if they are not here by 5.30 a.m., I'll start without them. Maybe they will catch up with me. So I started to head down the sagebrush trail, headed to where he got the picture. 
The wind was from my left to right, and the sun was on my left shoulder. Halfway down the path, two deer must have smelt me because they were on my right and started running. So, I kept walking, and the sun started to come up, and when I hit the first turn on Sagebrush Trail, I heard something like talking on the ridge on my left. At first, I thought it was friend A and friend B, with friends A's black shirts on. So, I hit a tree, and yelled, Hey guys, wait up! Then, they started to walk faster, and I yelled, Very funny guys. This is when I got a great look at them. Then, I knew what I was looking at on the ridge. It was two Bigfoot creatures. They were black and very huge. I tried to catch up with them, get a picture with these things, and they were walking fast. Once they get to the bottom of the ridge, they took off into the brush, but I did manage to get a whole good picture of them. You can see in the picture, the one turned to look to see if I was trying to follow them. When the one turned to look back, he had to turn his whole top half of his body with his left arm going across his chest to look back at me. I tried to follow them, but once they got in the brush, I could not hear or see them. But I got a great look at them, and they were black as coal. The hair length was as long as a bear, and surprisingly well-groomed. At any time, they could have stopped and tore me in half, but... All they wanted to do is get away as fast as possible. The other thing I noticed, or the only other thing, that made me look up on the ridge was I heard something like somebody talking, but I could not make it out. It sounded like somebody outside your home talking, but again, it just sounded like muffled noise. Kind of like an 8-track tape player that was eating the tape. I did not smell anything like wild animal but this could be because the wind blowing on top of the ridge. I searched for footprints of hair samples, but they came up empty-handed. A follow-up investigation report was done by investigator Mark Mazel. A site visit was performed on this area in June 15, 2013, and the following can be added to this report. The sighting took place on Shadebrush Trail in Salt Fork State Park. It was about three-fourths of a mile down the two-mile trail. At the point of first seeing these animals, the witness was approximately 200 feet away, on a ridge that was most likely cleared of brush. When I went to that spot, he stated that they were much bigger than myself. I'm about six feet tall. He also stated to me that they made me look small. The two animals were dark in color, and the witness describes them as huge. The witness described the long arms, longer than a human. Their walk and gait was weird, as they were sort of squatting as they walked. The closest that he was to these animals was upon the initial sighting. The witness was not able to discern any specific features. He simply was not close enough. He did note that the hair was not matted and had a very slight shine to it. When the animal turned to look at the witness, the animal turned its entire body. The witness also did not notice a neck and describes the turning motion as stiff. We moved to this location two years ago. We only lived here a few weeks and my four-year-old came running into the house and said he didn't want to play outside anymore. He seemed upset but not extremely frightened. When I asked him what was wrong, he said he saw a monkey man looking at him through the trees. I went out there, and nothing was there. I searched around the area, but didn't see anything. My son took me to the tree and showed me where someone or something was looking at him, between a fork and the tree. That was two years ago. Yesterday, my oldest son, aged 15, was standing in the living room, glanced out the picture window. He says that something huge and black ran from some trees we have there besides the garage. I was kidding and said, is it Bigfoot? And very seriously was like, yeah, I think it is. I ran out the back door, which is toward the opposite side of the garage than where whatever it was would be standing. I ran behind the garage and to the other side, but nothing was there. 
I live near a heavily wooded area, and the woods are close to the house, behind and to one side of it. The garage blocks the view of the yard, and you can only see the front side from the window. Whatever it was would have had plenty of time to run into the woods. Tonight, my son's friend Bobby was visiting for the night and was outside getting things ready to build a fire when he called my husband from his cell phone to the house. He thought my husband or son was playing a trick on him to try and scare him. He told him to come out, and when my husband went out to him, Bobby told him something big was running from the tree to tree, looking at him. He said it was black, and even though it was dark, he saw the outline of the face, which is why he thought it was my husband or son. This would have been about 40 feet, ending to 20 feet away from him. He said it came from the right outside the tree line, from the yard, and then went into the tree line, running from tree to tree, looking at him, getting closer, like it was trying to hide from him, but still keep an eye on him. When my husband came out, Bobby turned away to ask him if my son was playing the joke. When he turned back, it was gone. They came in and told me, so we went out with the camera, took some pictures of the woods in the dark. I don't know if I got anything or not. Whatever it is, from descriptions given to me, it's about 6 to 6'4", six and since everybody says it's about the size of my husband or son, husband is six and a half, and son is 6'2". Note, the porch light was on, and you could see the edge of the tree line because of the light. My cat that hardly ever leaves the deck has now disappeared. I attribute it to the old age thing, though because she was about 14, after all. But she was fine the night before when I fed her, and she does not ever disappear. She always sticks right by the house. There were no other witnesses. My youngest was playing on the deck. My oldest was standing in our living room, talking to his father and I. Bobby, my son's friend, was trying to get a fire started. There is also a big field leading into about 80 acres of woods. My house, remember, sits with woods very close to one side, with about four acres of open yard on the other side leading to more woods, then the highway. Across the highway, there are more woods. Close to the back of my house are woods that go back roughly 700 feet, then hit a huge field, then to more woods. There is a house way back in the woods, but nobody really lives there, and they are only there for a few weeks out of the year. I cannot see the house from mine. There are maple, oak, pine, and ash trees. I am the only house on this side of my street, with only a few houses on the opposite side spaced very far apart. A follow-up investigation report was done by investigator Mark Mazel. I performed a site visit to this area on August 7th and 12th, spoke to both of the witnesses. The following can be added to these reports. Both witnesses described the animal as being six and a half to seven feet tall. The very first witness describes the animal as muscular, as his sighting happened at around three in the afternoon. The second witness again was unable to describe the animal's build, partly due to it taking place at around 10.30 at night. Both witnesses described the animal to have had a pale face and hands. Both also described the head shape as round. The witness, the first one, stating that it did not have facial hair. The second states that the animal did not have a neck, while the first one did not notice it. Witness 1 describes the animal's arms as long, with large hands that were facing rearwards. Witness 1 observed the animals from a bay window on the side of the house that was approximately 50 feet from this animal. The second witness saw the animal from approximately 100 feet away, and saw the animal near the woodline. The second witness did state that, as the animal was leaving, he did hear one knock as it was heading further into the forest. The very first incident lasted only about 30 seconds in total duration, the second lasting about two minutes as the witness was trying to figure out what he was seeing. Both describe the animal as only moving on two feet. Both state that the animal headed into the wood, 
east. The second witness was unaware of what had transpired the previous day, when his sighting had occurred. Further examination of the area provided the following information. The area runs along an interstate highway. The woods behind the house open into a large field, followed by more open woods. Further back, another field opens up, and then again, more woods are present. Eventually, this will lead to a house. There is actually a drainage area to the south of the house that leads to a creek that crosses under the highway. Signs of movement were abundant in the woods, with deer and raccoon prints being seen very often. Actually, a deer carcass was observed near the road, as was a possum near the south woodline. No other footprints were found. The household also throws their peelings and spoiled food out into the woods. That attracts animals. The cat has still not shown up at the residence. Farms and a horse barn are nearby, as was the abundance of wild berries. This happened back in October. Just past dusk, while with my hunting partner, we were camped up on a hill above the ravine that we bow hunt every single year. I went there to take a leak on the porta potty that we had set up a hundred feet from the campsite. While sitting there, with the glare of the campfire in sight, I noticed a really stinky smell coming from the direction of behind me. I stood up, turned around to see this animal standing there a short distance away, staring at me. I looked at this thing in amazement. It was leaning on one foot, just looking right at me. I was totally terrified. It was white in color, had dark brown skin, an apparent round head, and real deep sunken in eyes. Although it was about my height, 6'2", it was very wide at the shoulders. I would have to say it was three and a half to four feet wide, which made its waist look thin in comparison. Since I had a shovel to bury my waist, I screamed at the creature and waved the shovel in the air. Once I did this, it sprinted into the woods, down the ravine, at a very alarming pace. I could hear it busting branches as it left the area. My friend came running over, wondering what was wrong. I told him what had just happened, but he just couldn't believe me. That was until the next day, when we went right to the location and found the large tracks going towards the ravine. I think, after him seeing them, he was somewhat convinced that I had seen something very unusual. The other thing I noticed was its hair coloring looked dirtier below the waist. There was also a follow-up investigation, and if there were any other stories, when the property owner found out what I saw, he asked that we didn't hurt them, and they mean no harm, which meant they knew that they were around. One of the property owners admitted seeing a similar colored creature. The property we hunt on consists of 150 acres of the roughest terrain here in Ohio. Since I've talked to this witness multiple times, and his story has been consistent year after year, he noted that the creature was only 20 feet away when he saw it. Its face appearing to be dark in color, and no neck was visible. The overall bulk of this creature is what impressed him the most, and he estimated it had to be a weight of around 350 pounds or more. The area has a good-sized stream that flows all throughout the ravine. There is a good-sized cave there that he has seen from a distance, but has never had the courage to check it out. And this area also has had a long history of Bigfoot reports, strange sounds, it's an area that clearly warrants further investigation. A boy of 12 years of age, back in the fall of 1998, was squirrel hunting on his parents' property. His parents own over 100 acres of land, which also has livestock on it. At any rate, the boy, whom we'll call Michael, was sitting just inside the woodline, waiting for the perfect chance to get a squirrel. He heard something running towards him, off to his right, 
thinking it was a deer. He soon discovered that it was actually a rabbit running through the woods. A moment later, he heard some heavy walking and thought it was a person. It wasn't. What Michael saw was described as between 7 and 8 feet tall, was white in color, and the skin on its hands and face being black. Mike noted that, for a fact, the fingers on the hands were long and slender. The creature rested one of its hands on the side of a tree. He did not see the eyes, but that could have been because of the bangs hanging over them. He only saw part of the ears. He did see that the head was not rounded like a human, but sloped back to a point. He also said it was fat. I finally learned what he meant by fat. It was very bulky from the waist up. Michael saw all of the creature except below the shins. And after about 30 seconds, this creature noticed Michael. They had a brief stare down, and Michael finally gave in by running out of the woods, through an open field, and back to the house. As it turns out, Michael was roughly 35 feet from this creature. The witness was sitting on a rock with a shotgun, waiting for a squirrel to come by. So, he had been squirrel hunting all day. The sighting also took place on Thursday, October 15th, 1998, around 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This took place in high terrain, but also down in a valley. A creek runs through the valley that the creature was running through. After listening to the Bigfoot scream recording that I would heard on the BFRO, I played it for two friends of mine, and we all agree that it is exactly what we heard. In the summer of 1999, we were working on a cabin that my friend was building in this county, about three miles away. Around 2 a.m., we were all awakened by a series of screams. We had no idea what they were. Later, we figured they were a bobcat. When I listened to this recording, I am positive that is what we heard, and everyone agrees. I have heard it one other time in 1999, but not since then. My friend who actually owns the cabin and his son has also heard the scream on other occasions. I was even dreaming when I was awakened. I think I may have heard a howl in addition to this series of screams, but I can't be sure. A follow-up report was done with this witness, and talking with them, he said the sounds they heard were in no way anything like an owl, cougar, bobcat, coyote, bird, etc., the series of screams they heard were so loud, it woke all of them from a sound sleep. He even downloaded the Ohio sounds from BFRO, played them for the other guys that have heard the sounds near the cabin. They all agreed, that is what they've been hearing. What I observed to this day still haunts me. Back in the springtime, May to be exact, I was driving, and on the side of the road, there, looked like a brown bear, just lying there, as if it were hit by a car. I did not completely stop. However, I did slow down to observe whatever was lying on the side of the road, standing up, glanced, and ran off into the distance. And this thing, when it took off, stood at about six and a half to seven feet tall. After this thing took off, it stepped over the guardrail, that is, on the side of the road. This thing looked like a large man in an ape suit. After the creature, or whatever it was, took off, I did stop, rolled down the windows, but did not get out of the car, because I was simply scared. When I did roll down the passenger window, it smelt as if I hit a skunk. The smell could have came from a skunk. I don't know where the smell came from, and I know the smell was there after rolling the window down. I got a chance to speak to the witness, J.S., and found him to be sincere and forthright in the description of his encounter. While driving southbound on Route 77, near the Salt Fork Lake State Park in Ohio, J.S. passed something huddled on the side of the road. It was lying up against the guardrail between the railing and the yellow line on the edge of the highway. 
At first, he thought it was a bear, but then realizing that it was a humanoid shape that was in a hunched or crouched position, much like the duck and cover position that the infamous 1950s school children were instructed to do when going through a nuclear alarm test, on the knees with the head ducked low. His first thought was that whatever it was had been hit by a car due to its position and location on the side of the road. Confused as to what had been seen, J.S. quickly stopped, puts the car in reverse, and as soon as he backs up to it, the creature then stands up on two legs, steps over the three-and-a-half-foot guardrail, and walks into the woods. J.S. said that once he had backed up his car, he was about 15 to 20 feet away from this creature, covered with well-kept, long, brownish-gray hair, and the back was hairier than the front. He likened the length and texture of its hair to that cousin It from the TV show The Adams Family, smooth and flowing. J.S. stated that he did not see its face, but did remember quite distinctly that it had no ears. The head was more of an oval shape, rather than a circular shape, and its head sat squarely on its shoulders. The shoulders were also massive, probably three times the width of his own shoulders, and the torso and legs were huge and thick. He also emphasized that the hands were also huge and they would hang down to its knees. When asked for an estimate on the weight and size, J.S. told me that it exceeded 6'5 and weighed close to 500 pounds, maybe more. He also commented that in the 15 to 20 seconds he observed this creature, he could see such details about this thing because there was quite a bit of moonlight present at the time. After losing sight, he noticed a large pond lit up by the moonlight in the bottom of a nearby valley. With the window rolled down, he noted quite a stench in the vicinity, described as being between a skunk and a fishy smell. He did not feel safe getting out of his car because of what he had just witnessed. While reviewing this encounter, which occurred near the Salt Fork Lake State Park, I found there to be five other similar reports occurring in the same area. The Salt Fork Lake State Park borders Route 77 and has a large land area of over 17,000 acres of wilderness, which includes lakes, streams, woods, marshes, as well as the Salt Fork Lake, which is 3,000 plus acres in size alone. I woke up on the morning of April 17th, 2004, at about 5.45 a.m., made my way out of the tent to make breakfast. I was on a camping trip with my father at the time. As I got breakfast ready, I sat down to watch the water boil. And then I heard a loud scream, howl, sounding very much like the Columbiana County, Ohio recordings. As soon as I heard this, I ran down a hill from my campsite to the north bank of the Salt Fork Lake. On my way down, I hear another howl. Both were slightly shorter than the Columbiana recordings, but still the same sound. I know that they came from the southern bank, and I would guess that they were most probably a mile or so away. I only heard the sound twice, and I was still a little shocked and did not tell my father until a few hours after he got up. The howls did not wake up any campers that I know of, and two days before this incident, I was walking on a trail and found a series of human-like footprints leading down the trail in the same direction that I was traveling, west. I found one to still be in good condition, so I cast it. It was of a left foot. It measured slightly over 12 inches long and five and a half feet wide. It had three well-defined toes, one that was barely pressed down and one toe that is missing. Although there is a space for a toe in that area in question, other, less defined prints were found. They were in about four to four and a half feet strides. There were also no other witnesses, since my father was asleep, as was the rest of the entirety of the camp. There was also a follow-up investigation report done. I've talked to the witness on multiple occasions, and am quite confident 
he heard what he claims. The area in question has had a long history of Bigfoot sightings to the present day, and the area he was camping at has had Bigfoot sightings well within the actual campground. I personally examined the cast of the alleged left foot. It was broken in one part, which made it hard to distinguish what it truly could be, although its shape was definitely foot-like in proportion. Looking at photos, seeing the distance between the alleged prints, I can rule out black bear and humans. If there is more detail in the cast and the photos, more could be said. Credit must be given to the witness, since he's only 14, and took the time to photograph and cast the alleged tracks. I live in Lake Helen, Florida, and we have had several incidents that I didn't put together until I ran across the story of the recent sightings. My daughter and I share our home with two golden retrievers. It's not uncommon for my female to not want to go outside due to her nightly business for no apparent reason. Now, maybe there is. My daughter and I were in my bedroom around 9 p.m. one night when something slapped the side of the house so hard that it shook it. We looked around from inside but saw nothing. Three days later, at about three in the morning, my daughter in her bedroom, directly above my bedroom, sharing the outside wall, woke up to a loud house shaking slam, following by a loud growl. Her feet hit the floor upstairs at the same time mine hit the downstairs. We assumed it was just a bear, but never could figure out why a bear would hit the house and how it could hit hard enough to shake the entire house, waking us up both. This was shortly after February, in the wintertime. There were also reports in the adjacent area, which is a community within Lake Helen. Where this happened was within walking distance of each other, and the adjacent areas there have been other sightings. I don't recall any specific weather conditions, but I can tell you it was pitch black outside. First time was around 9 p.m., and second around 3. There was actually a follow-up investigation. The witness and her daughter live in Lake Helen, an area that has a rich history of Sasquatch activity. In fact, there was so much activity that in the 70s that the town now refers to the creature as the Mole Man. The witness is aware of the Mole Man's stories, but hasn't put much faith in them until recently. On the night of February 24th, 2013, around 9 p.m., the witness and her daughter were getting ready for bed. Both were in the bathroom, talking, when something hit the side of the house. It was so loud and powerful, the wood frame of the house shook. Thinking someone might be trying to break in, they turned on all the outside lights, looked through the windows, and saw nothing, but called the police. The police looked around outside with flashlights, did not find anything. A few nights later, at about 3 a.m., they were both awakened by another house shaking slam to the house, followed by a loud, deep growl. In both cases, the house slam came from the same area, just under the master bedroom window. I spoke with the witness, then visited her property shortly after the incidents. The property is just about a half a mile from the 1970s Mole Man Orange Grove reports. It is just over a mile away from the Mole Man reports from the summer of 2012. That is in a separate report. The property is heavily wooded, as is the entire area. A power line road runs alongside the backside of her property. She has a compost pile that she adds leftover food to, several berry trees, and has never had anything like this happen in the many years she has lived there. Me and my buddy were out in the woods hunting in Pearson, Florida, on Nine Mile Road. We were driving out, and I noticed something big and brown in the ditch on the side of the road crouching down. Then it stood up and walked back and forth across the road. Then, crouching back down, we know for a fact it wasn't a human, 
It seemed to be about 9 feet tall. It was about 5.30, and 20 minutes before dark. In fact, there was also another follow-up investigation on this report. The man who spoke with the hunter, who was an avid outdoorsman, about his late afternoon sighting. He was hunting with a friend, but his friend went off in another direction, and then this occurred, so he was alone at the time of this sighting. The hunter was hog hunting in a very heavily wooded wildlife management area near Lake George. He heard bushes rustling, turned, and saw a human but ape-like face and shoulders squatting behind bushes. The gentleman has seen bear in the area and knows what he saw was indeed not a bear. It was 15 to 20 yards away, and when the creature was standing, it was much taller than his 6'5 frame. He estimates more like 8 to 9 feet. It had a flat nose, not like a human, but seemed to have other humanoid features. He watched it for a minute and a half behind the bushes before it stood again, turned and quickly walked away on two legs, towards the swamp. It was dark brown, mixed black hair and color. Heavy foliage blocked him from getting a better view of the creature's lower body, when it briskly walked away. Heavy footsteps could be heard. It did not vocalize. The hunter smelt an odor, similar to that of a wild hog odor, but much stronger and heavier during the encounter. He was hunting in that place because of the smell. He thought there was hog in the vicinity. After the creature walks away, the hunter left the area too. It was startling, at least for him. And although he had a gun, the creature's size was intimidating and he did not wish to investigate further. The area of this encounter was in Lake George State Forest, which is part of two wildlife management areas with more than 20,000 acres of virgin longleaf slash pine, bald cypress, and other bottomland hardwood hammock forests. During the wet season, there are also marshy floodplain areas, along with this national forest. This joins part of a network of protected lands, forming a wildlife corridor and roaming habitat for Florida black bear. Other species of wildlife that call the area in the vicinity home include white-tailed deer, turkey, bobcat, and of course, feral hog. There is currently another encounter that is being investigated in the same area. It is safe to say that Sasquatch or skunk ape activity is well and alive. A friend and I were fishing late into the night and early morning in a remote area between Ormond Beach and Flagler Beach next to a small bridge on Walter Boardman Lane. The friend of mine noticed a set of eyes shining in the woods while looking down a very small trail. We were wearing headband-style flashlights, and he told me to go check it out. As I looked down the trail, it was very obvious to me that the eyes were far enough apart and high enough off the ground to justify being concerned. I convinced myself and my friend that whatever it may be, it's more afraid of us than we are of it. A while later, maybe 20 minutes or so, he mentioned that it was still there staring at us. I walked slightly closer to the opening of the trail in an attempt to make out what it may have been, but still couldn't tell. A few minutes goes by, the same thing. It was still there and still staring towards us. I tried to make noise and decided to yell at it. It apparently wasn't too concerned because it didn't so much as blink or move. We again convinced ourselves that it was nothing to be afraid of. We continued with fishing, and not long after, my friend notices that it had finally moved on. We thought nothing more of it until I got the biggest scare of my adult life. As I was standing there, something let out the deepest, slowest growl that I have ever heard in my life. It sounded as though it was standing directly behind me and very close. I turned to look at my friend and the look on his face told me that I was certainly not hearing things. Without a second thought or even a spoken word, we drop our fishing poles 
and run as fast as we could to the truck. We jumped in, locked up tight. My first question was if he had heard it, and his response was, yeah, what was that? We were so scared that we weren't sure what to do. The decision was made a couple of minutes later to start the truck, turn on the headlights. He raced the engine, blew the horn repeatedly. Even after a few moments of doing this, and feeling sure that whatever it was had to have left the area, we were still very hesitant to retrieve our fishing gear. After a long while of deciding, we very quickly jumped out, threw our things into the back of the truck, and left. We had both lived in Florida for some time. We spent a lot of time on the water and in the woods, fishing, camping, all in remote locations. Never before, never have I heard anything like that. I can say for a fact that 100% it was not an alligator or a bear. Beyond that, I have no idea. I do know whatever it is may have been convinced two grown men, both of them, to immediately go out and purchase handguns to carry during each and every future outing. Not sure where the sound clips of the growls come from on the Finding Bigfoot television series, but they're about the closest thing I've heard of to the sound I heard that night. The only other detail that stands out to this day is that we had a buffet of shrimp, chicken gizzards, and livers, cut up fish sitting on the tailgate of the truck. On the 19th of May 2007, at around 8.30 a.m., my wife and I were on our way to the local bait shop on the Flagler County line in Central Florida. Our usual route to the shop at High Bridge Road is via Old Dixie Highway through Walter Boardman, also known as The Loop. I was turning left off Old Dixie onto Walter Boardman, and I looked ahead on the road and saw two vehicles approximately half a mile in front of me on Walter Boardman. At that instant, behind the vehicle closest to me, I saw a tall, dark figure on two legs swiftly cross the road from south to north. The figure that I saw was taller than the vehicle ahead of it, and it appeared to cross the road in three or four stiff-legged strides. I said to my wife, Did you see that? She replied that she had not, as she was looking for something in her purse. By that time, whatever it was, was already in the woods. So I sped up to reach the area where the figure crossed the road. My wife and I scanned the entirety of the woods where it had disappeared, saw no trace of it. I knew right away, though, that this was not a regular animal or man. It was extremely tall, dark and fast, although it did not appear to be running. The strides covered a great distance. We continued towards our destination and had arrived at a plantation, a state park where we fish. I won't mention the name. We mentioned what I had seen to the ranger who dismissed it as a simple black bear. I disagree. It was lean and too fast to be a bear walking on hind legs. I wish that I could have gotten a better look up close, but I have and will continue to look carefully as I drive the loop for another sighting of this very interesting creature. A follow-up investigation report was done. This witness saw a tall, dark figure cross the road, right after a red pickup truck that was a half a mile ahead of it passed it. The figure was approximately two to three feet taller than the truck and walked bipedally on two legs, the estimated height to be around seven to nine feet tall. He has lived in such areas like Alaska and is very familiar with seeing bears. He firmly stated that this was not a bear sighting, the witness has visited this location several times to look for evidence, but with no success. The Plantation Ruin State Park is 150 acres through the Bulo Creek, travels before it empties in the Tomaka Basin. The park is a part of the Greenway Corridor that connects the nearby North Peninsula Recreation Area on the coast.